Hello everyone, thanks for joining us today. I am opening up the webinar, but we're not going to get started just yet. I'm going to wait for everyone to arrive. Hello, this is Leah. Thanks for joining us today. We'll get started in just a moment. Hello, this is Leah Freeberg with Fluke Reliability, and thank you for joining us today for this Best Practices webinar. You probably know Fluke is a test tool provider, and you may also know that we produce some of the industry's favorite reliability tools, from infrared cameras to vibration meters, but you may not know that many of the measurements that our tools collect now flow automatically into EAM systems of record. It happens via a framework that we call Fluke Connect. So our goal at Fluke Reliability is to better connect asset management data and teams with asset management systems to drive connected knowledge. And of course, that knowledge depends greatly on best practices in condition-based maintenance. So that's why this series of webinars explores reliability maintenance strategies. And that's why we feature speakers from a variety of expert backgrounds. But before the presentation, I have a few housekeeping items to go over. Today's session is being recorded, so your phone lines are muted to minimize background noise. Also, we will save time after the presentation for your questions. If questions come up during the presentation, you are very welcome to use the questions feature on the GoToWebinar panel. You can submit questions as we go. So take a minute now, find the questions tool in the dashboard. At the end of the talk, I will share as many of your questions as time allows for our presenters to answer. If we have unanswered questions at the end, we will follow up with written answers. If you'd like to receive the slides from today's presentation, please let us know. There will be a survey that appears at the end of the session, so don't hang up. A recording of this webinar will be available on the Excelix.com webinar website within the day or so. Excellent. That's it for the housekeeping items, and now for the main event. Today, we are very pleased to have with us Glenn Pierce, Vice President SDI, and Brian Harmon, Director of Procurement SDI, and they'll be presenting on MRO inventory amid COVID-19. Very, very timely. A certified project management professional, PMP, Glenn Pierce has more than 20 years of experience in maintenance management, capital projects engineering, and manufacturing operations management to provide a more connected approach to SDI's seamless solutions. As a certified TMP instructor with a strong focus on Six Sigma, Pierce brings a creative problem-solving approach to each solution he designs. Because no two problems are exactly alike, he custom tailors each solution to demonstrate tangible and measure measurable results for clients. Welcome, Glenn. Thank you for being with us today. Good morning, and thanks, everyone. Our second presenter is Brian Harmon. Glenn, if you'll forward to the next slide, we'll take a look at Brian. There we go. As the Director of Procurement at SDI, Brian Harmon is responsible for ensuring the company's supply base works harmoniously in a connected ecosystem to better serve clients. Harmon is a dynamic supply chain professional with a track record of rapid growth through delivered results for SDI, and previously with such companies as CRC Industries and Dorman Products. He's adept at overcoming complex supply challenges, establishing strategic alliances, and fostering positive supplier relations. Brian, welcome. Good morning, everyone, and thank you. Indeed. I really, really appreciate that you all have put so much work into updating your supply chain management strategies for this current situation for COVID-19. So before we get started, can you give us some insight into what SDI is about? Yes, and uh, thank you. Um, thank you for the uh, kind introduction, Leah. You're welcome. Um, it's, an honor, it's an honor to be here today. Uh, it's an also an honor to be uh, a partner with Fluke Reliability. Um, you know, we share industry uh, experiences, lessons learned, and, and best practices. Um, so just before we go into the, the meat of the presentation, a little bit about SDI, who we are, and uh, kind of what we do. Um, you can see there our, our 
mission statement uh, is kind of unique, and, and one of our uh, our company mission statement really means something to us, and we drive to that. Um, and it, you know, very basically, we want to change the way people think about MRO. We want to challenge the status quo um, and you know, transform MRO from a category of spend to a valuable uh, value creating digital supply chain. We brand ourselves as a digital supply chain company using technology to change the way people approach and the way they, they handle MRO and the supply chain feeding into that. Uh, we are predominantly a North American organization. We operate for our clients in, in uh, US, Canada, and Mexico. We are a Six Sigma organization. Uh, and, and we've been doing this for, uh, for close to uh, 50 years. Next year will be our, our 50 year anniversary. Um, we focus a lot on our partnerships. Um, you know, some of those, just to name a few, we've already mentioned Fluke, uh, but, you know, Accenture, uh, AutoCrib is an industrial vending partner that we, we work with, uh, Penn State Center for Supply Chain Research. University of Tennessee Reliability and Maintenance Center is is one, and and Verkata is a uh, a uh, virtual camera uh, system with uh, that helps us do secure storage management uh, basically 24/7. Um, some of the tools behind the scenes we use, um, we'll talk about a little bit later on about data and how we focus on data to to uh, as the basis for everything we do. Um, and we also have some analytical tools, which we branded as Zeus, uh, which we use internally to do data analytics and um, everything around our clients' data and management and help it feed into the supply chain. So the first poll question. Indeed, I feel very lucky to have you all here today. Thank you. And uh, to the audience, um, Given our current situations, we thought it would help us to know the current situation at your facility. So I'm going to start off, actually, by asking this question of everyone on the call. We'd like to know, how are your organization's maintenance and reliability teams currently working? So in your facility, is it pretty much the same as in normal times? Are most members on site, a small number working remotely? There's a skeleton crew on site. Most others are working remotely. We're running with a few or no team members on site, or we we're, we're had to shut. We had to be shut down. Um, so take a minute, read through those questions, and um, let us know which of those one and unfortunately just one question best reflects your current work situation. And this will will help. Obviously, Glenn and Brian have uh, put a lot of work into adjusting their advice for the current situation, but knowing where you all are at will help them during this presentation tailor what they say even more. So we have about 60% of the audience now who voted. We'll give it just another 30 seconds or so. Make it your best guess uh, and give us your answer. And then I'm going to share the results with everyone so we can see across the board how we're doing. All right, we are close to 75% and I'm going to close and share the results. Okay, so 15% say it's pretty much the same. 33% say most members are on site, but a small number are working remotely. 36% say a skeleton crew is on site and most are working remotely. 10% were running with a few or no team members on site and 6% are shut down. Brian and Glenn, what do you think about those numbers? Very interesting. Um, it pretty much fits what uh, we've been seeing with our uh, current customer base and the feedback we've been receiving. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Well, I know everyone's doing the best they can. So let's move on to the presentation. I'm going to hide the poll now and back to you all. Okay, thank you. Um, our original intent today with this webinar um, was to talk about best practices uh, normal under normal operating conditions. But you know, with COVID-19 and the pandemic, uh, we've kind of changed on the fly uh, just due to the extraordinary times we're currently living in, and it's kind of changed the way people are are thinking. And so we've decided to to pivot a little bit and talk about inventory management from a risk perspective. Uh, obviously, COVID-19 has uh, created a more demanding MRO marketplace. Uh, more than ever, you need to partner with your suppliers, supply chain, and sourcing people uh, 
to ensure you're getting you know, through this and, and, and maintain uh, operational effectiveness. Um, so we'll go through three areas of risk related to inventory management and uh, some of the things you can do to mitigate that risk. Uh, things the maintenance person can do uh, or should do um, and things in their supply chain, you know, people they can partner with um, and understand that communication is the key to that. Um, so companies that have gotten by with a break fix maintenance repair strategy, they need more proactive approach. I mean, that applies anytime, but even more so um, in today's uh, with everything that's going on. Uh, preventive and, and predictive maintenance that, that maximizes equipment uptime, reduces the need for emergency parts, um, and you know it's critical in this in the uh, current environment, but also post COVID nineteen world that's going to be very important as well. Uh, collaboration between maintenance and the procurement and supply chain professionals. Uh, is critical uh, for visibility into the supply and demand of reliable and predictable operations. At the end of the day, your MRO inventory uh, needs to support your maintenance strategies, whether you're in a reactive strategy, whether you're in that transition of, of planning uh, uh, strategy, or whether you've, you're on up that curve and you're into uh, you know, the successful realm of, of uh, predictive uh, type maintenance strategies. Um, so, you know, from a reactive standpoint, you know, procur procur procurement's normally focused on cost reductions, right? So when you talk to uh, the procurement pr professionals of the world, they're looking how to reduce costs through either volumes or uh, what they're buying, where they're buying it from, leverage and spend from different suppliers. Uh, in today's, you know, environment, it's more about uh, the supply chain itself, not so much cost at this point. Um, you know, plan maintenance uh, demonstrated by measured improvements in availability, scalability, manageability, uh, but it must be collaborative. Uh, you can't do that in a bubble. Uh, it takes that alignment. Uh, your maintenance strategy must be supported and aligned with your MR to MRO inventory and, and the strategy that supports that. Um, your, for lack of a better term, your maintenance strategy is only as good as your MRO supply chain that supports it. You know, in my career, I've seen a lot of um, what some would consider world-class maintenance organizations that fail in basic functions due to MRO supply chain. They know the part's going to fail, but when it does fail, they look and the part's not in stock, right? Um, you know, many times it's a, it's a simple storing function. It may be inaccurate inventory, poor cycle counting methodology. There are several things that can go into that. Uh, but from a maintenance standpoint, it's important to have the part uh, when you need it um, at, at the appropriate time. So uh, we'll talk a little bit about um, MRO industry, the overview, uh, the market landscape of, of MRO. And some, some folks will know this. Uh, some of these numbers may be surprising, but you know, the MRO uh, global supply chain market is a $650 billion a year market. Um, around 143 billion in North America alone. Uh, most MRO or indirect spend is high volume, uh, low value transactions, typically less than, than $400 uh, per transaction. And what that means with the cost of creating purchase orders, you know, anywhere between 75 and $250 uh, for each purchase order from, from end to, to invoice, from source to pay. Uh, that can get very, very expensive because you're talking hundreds and even thousands of, of transactions. Um, MRO maturity in the marketplace is an issue. Uh, for most, MRO is a necessary evil of, of manufacturing. I know back in uh, my day, you know, as long as the part was there, uh, it, it's good. Um, you know, one of the questions I ask, I, I meet with a lot of plant managers, and one of the first questions I ask is in their in their weekly staff meeting, how often does the storeroom or MRO spare parts come up? Um, and if the plant manager tells me every week or every so often, that tells me they've got a problem in their supply chain. That should never be on a plant manager's radar. That should be one of those things that just functions behind the behind the scenes. Um, so there's a historically there's a lack of of strategic focus on MRO. There's a lack of investment in the processes and, and lack of innovation. I, I see lots of storerooms that are that are still operating the way they did in the 
in the 80s or even even uh, beyond that. Um, you know, lots of clients, I've seen this as well. I visit a lot of different types of manufacturing, but I've seen clients purchase brand new ERP systems and they load their old data in the system. It's kind of like buying a brand new Mercedes and you know, putting your old tires on the Mercedes. Um, you know, inventory is not connected, connected to your uh, computerized maintenance management systems or CMMSs. Uh, on occasion, but not very often, I see, you know, barcoding in place or no technology in place to manage storeroom, scanning devices, automated cycle counting, uh, things like that. Um, disaggregated, uh, increasingly global supply chains, there's a limited visibility to future demand, stockouts, uh, process waste. Um, and we do a lot of process mapping on, on uh, MRO uh, process flows. And, and basically what we end up doing is gap analysis and finding out where some of the uh, shortcomings are. Um, MRO supply chain historically is, is very highly fragmented. Uh, it's a very segment, uh, segmented supply base. No single supplier in the market, you think about MRO, and this is, this is another surprising statistic, but no single supplier has more than 5% market share in the MRO market space, which is uh, pretty surprising to me. Um, general and specialty distributors, you've got local distributors, you've got regional distributors, you've got national distributors. Then you have your OEMs, which in lots of cases are, are global uh, in, in nature. Um, with Amazon and other e-commerce catalogs, we're beginning to see a shift in uh, industry consolidation uh, and it's it's mostly out of um, out of demand um, you either shift or get on board or you're going to be left behind and I you know, we're seeing the COVID-19 crisis I think is is uh, is putting shedding some light on some of those gaps uh, change is being demanded in the global marketplace uh, COVID-19 has brought many uh, gaps to light um, there are shifts in e-commerce uh, we're seeing now i was on uh, amazon the other day not to pick on amazon but you know the government's taking control of, of lots of ppe supplies and uh, you can't just go out and buy face masks anymore they're hard to come by uh, for our client base we've had to jump through hoops uh, to keep continuity of supply on some of those things that we never would have thought would be critical in the past but they have become very very critical um, more influence from reliability programs, machine learning technologies, the Internet of Things, all of, the, all of these up and coming technologies are putting a stress on the uh, MRO supply chain and they're starting to get the focus that it, it, it deserves. Uh, enterprise asset management systems are um, when you those are up and coming and people are starting to realize some of the gaps in the MRO supply chain because of that. Um, and folks are moving to towards more of an enterprise-wide focus versus focusing on MRO. It used to be MRO and storerooms were operated by plant and every plant kind of did their own thing. So now you're getting folks to realize that it's, a, it's an enterprise-wide objective, not just single plants and you need to standardize across your, your organization. Um, some of the MRO challenges, uh, and these are uh, some benchmarking we do with our clients and some of our partners. Uh, the majority of the sources for this information I'm showing here are some of these statistics. Uh, Penn State Center for Supply Chain Research, uh, which is one of our partners and one of those SMRP, um, which most of you guys I'm sure are, are familiar, familiar with, Society for Maintenance and Reliability Professionals, uh, and also SDI's 49 years of, of market intelligence. Uh, we've learned a lot of things over the years, uh, what we've been doing. so. 75% uh, of MRO inventory and purchasing data is inactionable. And we'll talk about that term inactionable a little bit later on in this presentation. 25% um, of labor cost, mechanics chasing parts and not turning wrenches. It's, it's non-value added. Uh, for those of you that understand the eight wastes of, of lean, uh, that's one of the, the key things. Folks running all over the place looking for parts. 50% uh, of the work, work orders cannot be completed because they're waiting on parts. And I, I've seen that where it's, it's even higher than that in some of the site assessments and, and uh, industrial partners we've, we've uh, talked to. 42% of unplanned downtime can be attributed to poor supply chain practices, wrong min-max levels, improper lead times, 
um, that lead time is, is one of the things that's come to light now with the COVID-19 that is, that is putting stress on supply chains. And, and Brian will talk about that a little bit more detail shortly. Uh, being a slave to single source suppliers or OEFs and just poor data in general. 65% plus of all demand is reactive and 97% of lead times are inactive. Uh, while work order backlogs continue to grow um, and because of the misunderstanding of the actual lead time on, on the parts that you need. So obviously we're in some challenging times. Um, the COVID-19 crisis has created uh, many unique challenges that uh, we may not have realized just a few weeks ago. Um, lots of folks are, are modifying what they're doing in the marketplace. We've been at, at SDI, we've been actively polling our clients and partners on uh, how folks have been changing, how you're adapting to what we're doing. We, we actually have a weekly uh, newsletter that's been going out, kind of sharing some of those uh, best practices or, I guess, you know, change on the fly type practices uh, across the industry. Uh, the, our second edition of that went out yesterday. Um, Reduce or altered shifts for maintenance and engineering staff. Uh, production assets of essential industries are maxed out. Um, I've seen and talked to some folks where um, PMs are being postponed and they're focusing on on output, uh, which we all know as maintenance professionals, that's that's not a good habit to get into. Um, Unmanned or reduced staggered shifts, uh, confines uh, space in the storerooms, and the need for social distancing is limiting staff. You know, most folks, have, you don't have a lot of real estate for storerooms, right? It's it's very small, compact space in lots of lots of cases. So obviously, from with social distancing, that creates a challenge in itself. Um, storerooms are not secure. Uh, they're either self-service or they're they're free to every, anyone in the organization to go in and and um, you know, what what we've seen in, in some of our uh, partners is that you know some of the things have become hot commodities now, right? Respirators and uh, latex gloves and things like that. And we have had some instances we've seen that our clients these things just disappear. Um, they hit a loading dock and and they end up going somewhere. Nobody knows where they are. Uh, who would have ever thought respirators and hand sanitizer would be in short supply? Nobody would have thought of that just a few weeks ago. Um, not to mention toilet paper. That's a whole different story. We won't, won't go there. Um, I've spent a majority of my career in manufacturing roles and never knew the difference between an N95 and a KN95 mask. Um, basically, a, a KN95 is basically the Chinese version of the N95 mask, but I didn't know that. And I've been, I've been in this industry for my whole career and, uh, many, many years. And, uh, I, I never knew that. So we learn something new every day. All right. Um, so what can you do? And uh, I'll turn it over to Brian. Uh, Brian's going to cover some of the uh, mitigation strategies of, of what you can do to, to address some of these concerns. All right. Well, hello, everyone. Um, this is Brian Harmon. Um, glad you could all join us today. It looks like we've got a, a poll question number two before we get started here. Thank you. Yes, I'm going to do the same thing, folks, as before. I'm going to turn this poll live so that you all can answer. How strong is the collaboration between maintenance and the supply chain in your organization? Select just one of these options. We communicate regularly and our systems are integrated. We communicate regularly, but our systems are separate. We operate fairly independently except for emergency needs. We don't really get along. And I, there may be other, other realities in there. So just pick the one that is the most reflective of your current state. We have about half folks who've voted already. I'm going to give it a few more minutes, and then we'll talk about the results before we get back to what Brian has to share with us. So how strong is the collaboration between maintenance and the supply chain in your organization? We heard Glenn say the communication is is number one in this so you'll see communication and collaboration here we're at about 70 percent going for 75 are you integrated are you communicating or are you independent or you just don't talk 
All right, I'm going to close it down and share the results and see what we got. 17% communicate regularly and their systems are integrated. 46% communicate regularly but our systems are separate. 32% operate fairly independently except for emergencies and 5% don't get along. All right, so now I'm going to ask Glenn and Brian, how does, how does this uh, relate to what you typically see? You know, I'd say it, it falls in line with what we do normally see. It, 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 it points out that there's opportunity for, you know, further integration, really, uh, is mm -hmm. the, main, the main takeaway there. Mm -hmm. Well, I'm glad that 46% uh, already have good communication because that's a good pillar. All right, I'm going to shut the poll down now and turn it back over to you. Okay, um, so I, I first wanted to just talk a little bit about um, some of the supply chain tactics, uh, you know, that, that that really are important to help mitigate what we're all facing today with COVID-19. Um, you know, the the first piece, it sounds kind of obvious, but really, but, but really just making MRO part of the plan. Um, in a lot of cases, a lot of systems uh, it don't have MRO as part of, say, their MRP replenishment planning. Uh, it's it it's not part of the automated replenishment planning, um, you know, and that's a first step to see where there's opportunity to to expand that and just build it into the overall paradigm of, of supply chain planning, um, you know, and that that will in, in inherently increase it visibility on the MRO demand, um, you know, the demand piece is a is a huge part of it whether you're forecasting it or not, um, you know, whether you're looking at historical volumes. Um, you know, it, all of those things will, will help you get some get some foresight on, on where demand may be. Um, you know, as Glenn mentioned a little bit earlier around inventory accuracy, uh, this is one of the Achilles heels of, uh, of, of parts availability. If, if you don't know what you have, you don't know when you need more. Um, and the, this next, the fourth bullet here about identifying inventory critical spares uh, is 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 of particular interest. It's it's one that we uh, really focus on with our clients. Um, you know, defining what exactly is a critical spare varies from organization to organization. Um, you know, a lot of times it's about lead time. It's uh, you know, it's about uh, what machine those items go to. Hey, if it's on our line one or high volume item or high high volume machine, that's going to be critical to the operation. You know, those. Those types of, uh, you know, practices to identify those items are are critical because clearly wherever you identify uh, where there there's the largest risk, that's where you're going to want to focus in terms of just bolstering your on-hand inventory levels and your supply stream strategy. Um, you know, interestingly enough, I mean, you know, it used to be just lead time was part of what um, factored into uh, that equation of what's a critical spare, but you know now. Um, the country of origin, the ultimate country of origin, is is really a kind of a, a new uh, piece of the puzzle that you know typically if it was bought through U.S. distribution at say a five-day lead time, it didn't really matter that it ultimately came from from China or or, or Europe or wherever it uh, originated from, and and now with lead times being constrained, you know uh, borders are, are are shut down in some cases. Those uh, that country of origin is is an integral piece. Uh, and the second to last bullet point here around relationships, I mean, this is this is very key where, you know, we're starting to see even with, you know, large MRO distributors and things, they're subject to, to governmental allocations and things. Um, and and if you don't already have a strong relationship with some of these suppliers and you're expecting the same kind of lead times, um, you know, there may be risk there. Uh, the last bullet point here is really around um you know evaluating you know scheduled maintenance um and, and really trying to plan further and further out uh and that kind of rolls up to some of those points above about that that demand uh trying to the more uh foresight the more you can see down the horizon the, the better better off you're going to be to to make sure you got have what you needed so uh so speaking around demand management really the the first four bullet points here are really around mitigating demand um, and finding some creative ways to reduce the amount of uh, replenishment of at least new. Um, 
And what I mean by that, uh, the first three bullet points are really around, you know, hey, where can you reuse? Um, you know, where can you, uh, you know, upgrade products that you typically just went out and just replenished a new item when it broke? Um, where can you, you know, perhaps look at uh, either some remand channels to to buy those items, or or just you know send them out for repair where typically you just replace with new. Um, that'll just help just tamp down the the demand curve uh, and and you know make you less reliable on the supply chain if you can uh, re repair it yourself or you know with a with a nearby repair house. Um, the second to last bullet point here, uh, you know, sounds like it may be common sense, but you'd be surprised that with clients that have of ours that tend to have, you know, a, a large amount of different sites where they're doing uh, manufacturing, and there's a lot of common items shared across those sites. Uh, there's typically not a lot of visibility to transfer materials around, um, rather than just, uh, you know, triggering another replenishment buy. Um, that's also a good tactic to, to see where there's opportunity to look at that. Uh, and lastly, I kind of spoke a little bit about this in terms of just the hindsight, looking at your his, you know your your purchase history, uh, figuring out your your high spend items, your high volume items, where that overlaps with your critical SKUs, and 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 you know putting in in, in place some some tactics to help um, improve your availability. So um, a little bit more on 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 that uh, with with supply. You know, a lot of this there's several key things that can be done here, uh, and a lot of cases within storerooms or sometimes even out slightly outside of storerooms, there tend to be kind of squirrel stashes of of product. It's it's really good to get your eyes on that. Uh, you know, cycle count that inventory, make sure it's incorporated in in the system so you know what you have. Um, the the second bullet point around securing the storeroom. 24/7. This is kind of a standard practice here, but it, it's even more relevant now with with COVID-19, where you know, as that prior uh, poll indicated, a lot of us are working with with staggered shifts. Um, you know, a lot of folks are working remotely. Uh, you know, perhaps um, there's swing shifts going on, and and the standard you know oversight that you know is typically in place on on you know keeping watch on storeroom inventories may not be there. Um, and so, you know, a lot of uh, storerooms are experiencing shrinkage and, and uh, you know, parts disappearing and things like that. So keeping that security in place is, is, is uh, very important. Um, and again, about reduce, reducing the amount of demand, uh, you know, part of this just goes into just rationing and controlling the supply point. Um, we've seen a lot of clients have, you know, experienced a lot of benefit in deploying vending strategies you know you put vending machines in place for a lot of these typical uh and, and high usage uh whether it's ppe or uh other mro type materials uh to help reduce the consumption we see historically about a 30 percent reduction um, in consumption by deploying uh strategies like vending um you know considering your your min max uh is a is a big you know, and it's it's beyond just min max, right? It's it's looking at your order quantities. It's looking at uh, should we use blanket orders? Um, should we go out and do some forward buys? You know, given constraints we're seeing on lead times or country of origin, do we need to tick up the mins? Maybe you want to tick up the min and the max, so you're buying a little bit more each time, and your reorder point is is higher than before. Um, and then, you know that that does lead to an increase in inventory, but in some cases. That's an appropriate response uh, when you're seeing the supply variability that we're experiencing right now due to COVID-19. Uh, the second last bullet point here on OEM commercialization. Uh, this is, you know, a big one where, you know, Glenn mentioned a lot of the OEMs that tip, tend to be global in nature. Um, you know, if your operation is relying on, you know, a specific OEM replacement part from a German manufacturer or, you know, wherever it may be, um, in a lot of cases, you know, we encourage our clients uh, to to look at those items and see where there's opportunity to potentially, you know, retool the the operation to to um, you know gravitate from reliance on a specific uh, you know OEM provider that's you know that could be abroad 
uh, to something that's a little bit more standardized that's available on the MRO market through distribution. Um, you know, there, not only is there cost savings in doing that, uh, but there's, uh, you know, it reduces your, um, your supply variability. Uh, and that, that ties into the critical spares. And a lot of times those OEM items are your critical spares and where you can re-engineer those to be more standard, uh, you know, items available on the, the, the regular distribution market will, will only benefit you. Uh, so a few points here on sourcing. Um, you know, the first bullet point here is around what we call initiating a guerrilla sourcing tactics. Uh, and what we mean by this, um, you know, typically when you when you think of a kind of a guerrilla fighting force, you, you think of, you know, a loose chain of command, right? And it, it operates hard, hits hard and fast. Uh, and, and really how that translates into the MRO space is, you know, take a look at where you can, you know, push down decision making within your organization. You know, the the authority levels and approval letter levels required for POs, uh, you know, and a lot of times what we'll see is, in a situation like this where money gets a little tight through, you know, sales may be slowing down, uh, you know, due to COVID, uh, production levels may be slowing down. So there tends to be a tighter grip on, you know, spending with a checkbook. Uh, and what we tend to see is that results in, um, you know, waiting until the the item that's needed is, a, is an emergency. It's we're almost waiting too late to actually release the, requisition uh, to convert it to a PO. And uh, the more you can kind of force that that decision-making lower down into the organization and allow uh, POs to flow, the, the better off you'll be. Um, you know, uh, where we've, we've got some options listed here around conforming, you know, looking at your form fit and function of your, of your SKUs and exploring alternatives. Um, even just networking, benchmarking, you know, sharing best practices with peers, can can really go a long way. Um, even exploring alternative and non-traditional sources of supply. And what we mean by what we mean by this is, you know, on you, you might have a standard, you know, approved supplier for an item that you've been using for years, but really looking at some of the more dynamic opportunities or, and options out there, whether they're online marketplaces, uh, repair houses, uh, you know, suppliers that that typically supply other verticals. Um, you know, looking at gray markets, you know, surplus markets, there's there's all kinds of opportunities here to look at even direct to manufacturers. Um, you know, there's a lot of things that you can do with, uh, you know, you can look at their subscriptions that can be purchased to look at customs data where you can query specific uh, commodity types or, or uh, you know, different descriptions of items and see where those are flowing in not only to see where there could be some direct sources, um, but even to see where are they going to, who's buying them. Maybe you can reach out to them and, and buy them from them if you're having a hard time getting it through your normal channels. Uh, those subscriptions do tend to come with a bit of a cost, but they can be highly valuable to your sourcing team. Um, and, and lastly, just some, it's more tactical really, but looking at, uh, you know, forward buys, uh, and blanket orders really can help. I mean, you know, forward buys tend to kind of uh, do cause some ripple effects. You know, Glenn mentioned what's going on with toilet paper. That is the kind of thing you'll see in that space, but really blanket orders is is really kind of a more uh, conservative approach to really lock up supply, allow your supplier to go ahead and run up large amounts of inventory and hold it in stock for you and release quantities upon upon need. Uh, is is really one of the more preferred tactics there to ensure supply. So so lastly, I'll kind of wrap up with uh, just a slide here around the quality of your data and analytics. Obviously, data is information is power, right? And the more uh, you know line of sight that you've got on on cleansing your data, uh, making sure you understand truly where your needs are. You know, and that all ties into inventory accuracy. Um, you know, and being able to actually analyze uh, your, your purchase orders. We tend to see a lot of emphasis on, on this in, in organizations with their direct spend. You don't see it as much in the indirect spend place where there's, you know, a lot of these reporting tools and things uh, are, are set up to, to be able to analyze top suppliers, looking at it by category, by region, um, and, and, 
you know, within those categories that you know are strained, like PPE is a great example right now, understanding who are your top suppliers, uh, you know, who are your, you know, secondary tertiary sources, um, you know, where do you need to be setting up relationships and preparing, uh, you know, some some uh, secondary sources of supply. And, and, you know, the last piece there is just around contracts, um, you know, that can where if you figure out where your 80-20 is, focus there, get the right contracts in place to ensure the service levels you're looking for. All that really stems from having solid uh, data and analytics in place. Okay, thank you, Brian. Uh, this is Glenn again. I, so I'm going to follow up a little bit uh, on that, a little bit more around uh, actionable data. I think I mentioned early on uh, the term actionable data, uh, which is um, for us and, and most other people in the industry, it should be the foundation for everything. Um, before we go into that, we have our third poll question, though. Leah? Yes, we do. And it, of course, is meant to be very relevant. So one more time, folks, if you can go to your mice and answer the question, is your data actionable? Yes, my data is thoroughly actionable. Maybe, depends on what day it is. In other words, it kind of is, kind of isn't. Not at all. Or I'm not sure what is actionable data. What, what def how do you define actionable data? Tell me more. We have about 50% of folks answering, and I'm going to give you another 30 seconds to make a stab at answering this question, and uh, then we'll share it and hear what Glenn has to say about actionable data. We are almost there. 67% of you have voted. Let's get up to 70, and then we'll close and share. All right, I'm going to close it down. Here we go. 11%, yes, my data is actionable. 35%, maybe. 15%, no. And 40%, 39% say, tell me more. Good. All right. Back to you, Glenn. All right. Thank you. Um, so, uh, to the uh, 40%, uh, we'll tell you a little bit more about actionable data. Um, the, very simply, actionable data uh, gives you the ability to um, investigate, source properly, and, and everything you do, whether it be inventory management and all of that. Um, so the ability to identify, um, as Brian mentioned, find secondary and tertiary sources of supply. Um, in order to do that, you need more than just vendor information. Um, I, I see lots of folks when we get their data, we go through and they have, um, you know, vendor part numbers um, in there or vendor uh, descriptions and information doesn't really provide enough information to uh, take that forward. Um, substitution for products with the same forward fit and function is one thing that needs to be considered, right? Um, if it's a good example of that would be, I see lots of people using high dollar Sealmaster bearings on, on slow moving rotating equipment. It's not necessarily, um, you don't necessarily need to pay that for that premium bearing uh, for such a uh, slow moving operation. Um, actionable data means you have manufacturer and manufacturer part number uh, on uh, all the parts where that is available. And we'll talk about here in a minute, uh, OEM commercialization, that even becomes more critical on OEM spares. Um, we could include equipment model numbers, uh, drawings, country of origin, especially from OEMs. Lots of OEMs, you know, you, you order a part and then the first thing I'll ask you is, well, what, what's the machine model number that's going on, right? Um, they, they do that for a few reasons. Um, one, one is they don't have uh, real good control over their manufacturing process and one engineer prescribes a different part than another engineer prescribed. But more so, it kind of ties you to that. The example I use is, um, kind of like uh, Hewlett Packard printers, right? They don't make a lot of money on that uh, all-in-one printer you buy at Best Buy for $210. They make money on selling you ink. Uh, it's the same way with OEMs. So it's essential for OEM commercialization. Um, in order to be able to commercially uh, find commercially available parts in the marketplace, whether it be a motor or a gearbox, a bearing, a belt, whatever that is, um, 
you need to have the manufacturer manufacturer part number to go along with that to make sure that you don't cause turmoil in your operation because the part doesn't have the same form fit function. Uh, lots of times OEM commercialization, commercialization requires engineering support, especially with electronics, right? They, uh, OEMs tend to put, uh, uh, modify their drives. They, they change one obscure parameter to make sure it's not plug and play with another drive you can buy somewhere else, for example. Um, difficulty in uh, analysis on spin forecasting models, uh, root cause failure analysis, uh, because you don't have good data. Uh, if you have all the attributes of the data and all that, it can help you identify, um, you know, inventory levels, uh, lead times we talked about earlier is one of the other critical things. Um, and basically, it, it uh, enables you, having actual data enables you to make informed purchasing decisions around, you know, it's not always price. Sometimes it's lead time or availability, things like that. If it's taking you know, six months to get something out of uh, Europe, uh, you may be able to find a, a local source where you can get it within a few days uh, if you have the right right data. Uh, the last thing we're going to talk about a little bit is is critical spares and and redefining critical spares in the in this new world, right, of of COVID nineteen and and how all that works. Um, critical spares identified basically as this is one hundred and one, determine asset criti criticality which is impact on failure, frequency of failure, whether you're going to stock those parts or not stock those parts. Are they OEM spares? Are they custom made? Are they commercially available in the marketplace? And at the end of the day, uh, which most of the folks on the phone understand, you know, the risk analysis, is, is there a single source of supply? Is, if, the, if it is a single source of supply, is that supplier financially stable? Um, you know, obviously, with the comings in the last few weeks, uh, that that isn't always the determining factor anymore. So, um, you know, it's lessons learned, and we're learning every day from uh, COVID-19. Um, so, historically, uh, critical spares uh, has been defined. You know, that failure is immediate; it has an impact on production, safety, environmental, whatever the, the critical makes that part critical. Um, are those parts custom made, right? That impacts your lead time, where they're coming from. Sometimes it takes weeks or sometimes months to manufacture a part if you need it for an emergency breakdown or something. Um, what is the, that lead time? Are the parts available through multiple suppliers? Uh, and high volume items, uh, on ex you know, you want to try to get those on exclusive contracts. So, uh, you know, I think a lot of those were you know, kind of how we the 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 paradigm that we sort of had before COVID, and and you know, in this new world, a lot of these things are shifting. And you know, what we used to see as a critical spare, um, you know, now we're now actually seeing you know PPE at fall into and being now considered as as you know part of the criteria of what we you know uh, classify as a critical spare. You know, we we talked about. Um, lead times you know before we we very much uh were reliant or, or just you know assumed that that five-day lead time from a uh from a a u.s distributor was uh was very much reliable and, and now we've got you know forced into a world where we've got to look a little bit deeper into the 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 true ultimate supply chain of that item and look at its its actual country of origin to, to get some insight on where that lead time could be constrained and understand where you might have some delays. Um, you know, and we, we talked about through, uh, you know, multiple sources of, of availability of, of suppliers, um, you know, and this, and the day and age we're dealing with now, you know, it's, it's looking at some of these OEMs and understanding where can we convert this to commercially available alter alternates. Um, and, and, and lastly, this last bit about, uh, you know, where we looked at exclusivity and, and high volume, you know, where we've got high volume SKUs and exclusive contracts to really look at, you know, now it's it's not just a, a an effort of looking at, hey, where where can we pursue low cost country sourcing and and have that single source and and devote all of our attention there. Now it's looking at, you know, we were already seeing some some trends of with the tariffs and things uh, of looking at near sourcing and and whether it was in Mexico or, or in U.S. as opposed to Asia. Uh, 
you know, I think this world of, of COVID is, is really putting even further emphasis on that to look at, um, at near sourcing and, and where we can, uh, you know, have some geographical diversity of, of supply as well. Very good, Brian. Thanks. Um, so just in closing here, um, you know, kind of what we do with our clients, you know, we partner for success. We can't possibly go in and, and uh, tell them everything about their organization, right? It's about collaboration between maintenance and, and the supply chain. If you boil it down, it's maintenance team's basic needs, right? They need to know what's going on, right? Actionable data gives them that. They need uh, access to the bigger picture, right? And they need timely insights to facilitate decision making. Uh, all of these basic needs are all around data and connecting people to do it, right? You know, maintenance is driven by actionable data. In order to be successful, you have to have the, the storeroom and the MRO supply chain and, and actionable data to support every bit of that. Um, so we'll, you know, questions. Um, you know, if interested in learning more, you, you can email me or Brian directly. And uh, we, we have a, a newsletter that goes out uh, if you're interested in, in learning more about some of these things and, and what we're experiencing in the industry and some of our clients and some of our channel partners of, of how people are adapting and evolving. Um, so if, if you want to know more, feel free to uh, email me. Uh, I, for one, plan to do that, Glenn, because I would love to get a copy of that uh, of that newsletter. There's a lot that's going to continue to change here, I think. Thank you very much, both Glenn and Brian. And at this point, everyone on the on the line, you are welcome to use the questions tool in your dashboard to enter in questions for both of our guests to answer. I have a couple that have come in that I'm going to start answer, asking now. The first one being... If storerooms aren't secure and people are helping themselves to PPE and spare parts, how do you recommend that we monitor storerooms remotely? Um, so there are a couple of ways to do that. Um, you know, obviously the immediate need is is to uh, secure it, especially especially now. Uh, whether it be uh, camera systems, uh, there are a lot of camera systems available out there. Uh, one of our partners we use actually has facial recognition, uh, and, and we put them on most of our storerooms where if someone walks in, they're not in, in their, uh, their motion-activated cameras, so they aren't sitting there filming all the time. They just if somebody, and you can design a certain window, right? If somebody goes to this shelf, right, you can flip the camera on and through facial recognition know who it is and, and what they got. Um, so I, I think that's uh, the immediate need, one of the quick ways to do it. Long term, obviously, is to have a secure storeroom with key card access. Brian mentioned uh, industrial vending uh, is a good solution as well. Uh, you know, things are secure inside a vending machine, and, and you scan a badge or a card to uh, get things out is another one. And so having that identification of who took the part will help manage consumption. It, exactly. I mean, you know, Brian mentioned that just bending uh, that you know, we normally see a 30 percent reduction in overall consumption. I, I think it's for lack of a better term, it's just the fact that they know Big Brother's watching. Right. So instead of getting five pairs of gloves, they're only going to get one. All right. It's responsibility. All right. And another interesting question. Um, so you brought up a really good point that during times like this, the inclination is to tighten the checkbook. Right. But that. On the contrary, you recommend lowering the floor of authority to buy parts. Mm -hmm. So you've pointed out some tension there. Um, folks want to know how you have that conversation internally. Yeah, you know, and it's it's funny because um, you know both that and the, that prior bullet around uh, sort of loosening the, the chain of command and sort of decentralizing some of the. Uh, you know, authority levels are are actually you know contrary to our normal um, right uh, best practices that we would typically you know recommend uh, and encourage with our clients and things. Um, you know, and so I think it's you know when you get into a bit of a an emergency state, you know, I think there has to be um, some discussion with the management that you know if if you don't uh, encourage some agility within your organization's ability to react, um, you're gonna get stuck. Um, 
And, you know, we, we tend to see that just even, you know, before COVID, you know, that, that tends to be a typical constraint where, uh, you know, whether it's the maintenance crew or, or the buyers are operating with some kind of budgetary constraint on, you know, what all they can, they can buy. They may be proposing everything that they need and, and want to work on repair, but, you know, they're only getting approvals for half of it. And then, uh, we see requisitions that will just sit and in our clients kind of you know internal queue for uh, workflow approvals uh, for weeks by before they actually get approved and converted to a PO and at that point it's it's hot it's an emergency it's we needed it yesterday oh my god you know can you get it to us right now and mm -hmm. and I think what we're trying to you know that's the discussion that we need that that I would encourage folks to have with their uh, with their management and then within their organization is around, you know, point to those times in the past where you got caught because of a budgetary constraint. Mm, mm -hmm. And and if, if you can, you know, reference those items and, and talk about how um, they're going to be happening even more and more, there's the folks that are even available to make those approvals perhaps are now working remotely uh, and they're not on site to say, hey, you, can you approve this and get a signature? Uh, whether or not those workflows are happening electronically or, or they're more manual may lend itself to some discussion, too, around the environment that we're currently in with a more distributed working model. Okay. We have a lot of great questions coming in, so I'm going to fire a couple more at you guys. All right. Uh, is there a template available for actionable data to procure for greenfield production equipment? There's a couple, couple questions around that. So if you have new equipment, is there a template so that you can organize the actionable data that you need? Um, yes, um, I mean we we have some some internal equipments we use or in, internal templates we use. Um, you know, new new equipment is a challenge uh, in itself, uh, being that um, I used to do uh, capital equipment and and I was a capital projects engineer, installed a lot of capital equipment. We all know we get a list of what they consider critical spares from the OEM. Mm -hmm. and it, mm -hmm. and it costs you two million dollars if you wanted to buy everything. You could assemble the machine in the plant. So you right. have to, you know, you have to realistically go through that. I used to grab the factory techs that work for the OEM, right? So, all right, what do I really do, right? And and help me do that. Uh, but yes, there are certain um, templates that that we use to make sure that we're capturing the right data. You know, the the main one of those, and I'll just tell you, the, the big ones are manufacturer, manufacturer part number, right? Unit of measure is is a critical one that that goes overlooked a lot. And then as many attributes you can fill in about that. Um, specific part. So someone else has followed up. It's it's super interesting. Um, that they say that when they get new equipment, they at most get a manual and a bomb, but no form fitter function items on it. So then what do you do? Uh, that's a challenge. Uh, absolutely. And and I used to go through some of those same struggles uh, years ago. Um, that. And normally, I would utilize the, the factory techs again mm -hmm, uh, to mm -hmm. get some engineers and go through and do crawls on that new equipment to identify, all right, what are these critical components? Um, you know, what's going to shut this operation down? You know, if it's a dryer, obviously, you need a made belt, right, dryer belt, things like that. Um, I, I used to utilize the, the techs a lot. Uh, if, if you ask them the questions, they know more about that equipment than anybody. Right. Uh, most engineers don't don't engage them though. But that was one of the sources I used to use. Mm, okay. Okay. All right. Um, another question on storeroom. Do you have a software that you recommend for inventory control? Um, not any specific. Um, I mean, we we have for our clients, right? We have our own internal software that we've developed, right? So. Um, historically, we don't use uh, MinMax uh, as a storeroom trigger point. We use uh, demand forecasting, mm -hmm. uh, which is a, a model specific to our software. Um, but we also integrate, uh, obviously, I mean, Emate is a good example, right? We With Fluke's Emate system, we integrate with that. We integrate with SAP. We integrate with a lot of other of our client systems where we would use our inventory management tool our scanning and barcoding and all that to manage the storeroom, but that inventory is also reflected as, as the uh, the master record in our clients' ERP systems, so they don't okay. lose that visibility internally. Right. Magic word integration. Okay. Yep. We have time for one more question. Um, can you talk more about part reengineering and where it applies? 
Yes, um, and you'll notice we use the term uh, re-engineering and not reverse engineering. To me, reverse right. engineering is a cuss word, right? <laughs> we, so because you know you find a lot of people that uh, say, oh, we, let's go redesign this part. Well, we don't want to just redesign that part. We want to make it increase the life cycle of that part, make it last longer. It could be the application of that part. Um, but um, so it, it requires, um, you know, there are technologies out there that we use. Our, there's 3D scanning technologies, right, that uh, we use internally uh, for some of our engineers to use. But also uh, we can do some prototyping with 3D printing and technology. But it, it's not just to take apart and make, you know, make it the same, right? We want to take that part and, and re-engineer it to make it better. Uh, whether it lasts longer or um, whether it's less expensive or whatever that is, there ne there needs to be some benefit to re-engineer that part. If you're just designing the same thing over again, you you've wasted money redesigning the same part yep. in those cases. Thank you. That helps. All right. Will you forward to the last slide for me, Glenn? Yes. There is, folks, when I close the webinar today, and we, we are at the end, stay online because it'll take the survey a couple seconds to pop up, and we really want to get your feedback on today, your, your experience in general. Once you answer that survey, we will send you a copy of the presentation, and then the recording of this webinar will be up online on Excelix in just a day or so. So thank you very, very much, both Glenn and Brian. It was such a pleasure to have you here today. This is such valuable information. I appreciate it very much. Absolutely. Thank you, Leah. Thank you, everyone. All right. Best of luck to everyone. We'll see you next time, and thank you again. Bye-bye for now.